Today I have uh, the distinct privilege of introducing our first plenary speaker for the 2016 Kansas Health Foundation Symposium, Dr. Richard Carmona. From high school dropout to top graduate at the University of California, San Francisco Medical uh, School, the Surgeon General of the United States, uh, Dr. Carmona's career is remarkable for breadth, for accomplishment, and for consequence. He was appointed the 17th Surgeon General of the United States in 2002 and served through July of uh, 2006. He currently is vice chair of the uh, Canyon Ranch. He's president of the Canyon Ranch Institute and the first distinguished professor at the Mel and Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health at the University of Arizona. Uh, previously, he was a clinical professor of surgery, public health, and family and community medicine at the uh, University of Arizona. Uh, he has served as chairman of the Arizona Southern Regional Emergency Medical System and as a surgeon, detective, and SWAT team leader with the Pima County, Arizona Sheriff's Department, work for which he has received numerous awards for his law enforcement work. Dr. Carmona also served in the U.S. Army and was a combat decorated member of the Army's Special Forces in Vietnam. While serving as U.S. Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Carmona was a national and indeed a world leader on issues such as health disparities and disease prevention. In fact, his 2006 Surgeon General's report on tobacco helped blaze the trail for clean air ordinances and statutes around the country when it concluded that, and I'm quoting, there is no safe exposure to secondhand smoke. And we in Kansas, along with many others, are direct beneficiaries of that work. Dr. Carmona has committed his life and career to public health. His unwavering dedication to safety, to preparedness, and to better health through prevention have changed the way that millions of people view health and well-being. Dr. Carmona is quoted as saying, we must change from being disease-oriented to being health-oriented and focus attention on preventing health problems, not fixing them after they have happened. Immediately following his uh, presentation, Dr. Carmona will uh, entertain questions and answers. So during the course of his presentation, you may be uh, thinking of questions that you might want to ask. And with that, without further ado, please welcome the 17th Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Richard Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I kind of feel a little like Ricky used to say to Lucy, you got a lot of explaining to do. Uh, it doesn't engender a lot of uh, confidence in your... Uh, peers when they find out the Surgeon General is a high school dropout, but some of you think, well, it's just another federal appointee. It doesn't make a difference. So uh, I am um, thrilled to be here. It's my second time to Kansas. And um, I should have learned last time that you don't want to follow Steve Cohen uh, when he speaks. You know, what, what came to mind as I listened to him this morning is that when I was Surgeon General, I was always searching for partners because really the work that needs to be done in the nation and the world is about forming these partnerships that Steve is so good at. But what I realized is if every state had a Steve Cohen, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. So you guys are really lucky to have him. And I say that sincerely from the bottom of my heart because I've been to every state as Surgeon General after. I've traveled the world as your Surgeon General. And these are the people that make a difference. These are the people with passion that come forward and actually affect change in communities, inspire people, and have them step up at a level that they never expected they could do. So we are fortunate to, to have Steve. And I thank you, Steve, for the privilege of coming back today to be with you. Well, the theme is a wonderful theme. And I want to really thank you for that opportunity to be back and the privilege of being with you. And for your 30 years of health leadership with the health, Kansas Health Foundation. Because in that 30 years, you've had considerable experience and lessons learned which caused you now to generate a new vision and a strategic plan to move forward. 
You have envisioned the future where Kansans can make healthy choices, where they live and work and play. This is a vision that requires understanding and embracing the social determinants of health, health equity, and civic engagement, all that are highlighted in your vision and the strategic plan moving forward. Your zip code should not be something that you use to determine your outcome in life. And yet, in our country, that's still a reality. I know from personal experience. The new Kansas healthcare, health, uh, health uh, vision addresses these issues and also includes access to care. What I would add to access to care is, and maybe equally important, if not more important, is access to preventive services. And I'll make the case for you this morning, the health case and the business case of why that is so important. So I'd like to speak to you this morning from the vantage point first, as one of those kids that you call health disparate today. But when I grew up, those terms didn't exist. We didn't understand the implications of social determinants of health. That is, where you work, where you live, your parents' education, your education, your income level, all of those things that really have been memorialized in a wonderful paper done by my colleagues at the World Health Organization a number of years ago. But now we're starting to realize that one of the best predictors of your health outcome in this world is your socioeconomic status. So whether you're in sub-Saharan Africa or whether you're here in Wichita or in New York City, that holds true, the socioeconomic aspects of that. So probably some of the best training, experience, education that I received was not in college, not in medical school, not in graduate school, the, th the things that I've done. But really, uh, as a kid growing up on the block in New York City, because you see, my parents were immigrants. They came speaking Spanish, they spoke no English, and they adapted pretty quickly. I grew up in Harlem, 110th Street is where I was born. I grew up at a time when parents weren't responsible for your extracurricular activity. You went out in the street and played. We played stickball. I learned to swim in the Harlem River, which is why I'm so healthy. I've been exposed to every pathogen known to mankind. <laughs> my mom's goal, and I want, I want to preface my remarks a minute, because I had a wonderful conversation with Tanya this morning as I came in, and I got to meet her and just seen the passion in her eyes and her voice. But talking about empowerment and women, and I recognized in my own life that it was the women who inspired me. It was my mom who didn't have much of an education. My grandmother, Abuelita, who had a third grade education, who bought the family over, and they all just became citizens and worked hard. But my mom always inspired us to be better. And I think this discussion is germane to the social determinants of health, because maybe in me you can see what could potentially happen if we deal with these issues appropriately. I grew up in a little apartment that was roach infested. We slept with our clothes in the winter because there was no heat. It was too hot in the summer. We were happy kids, though. Everybody on the block was poor. I have two brothers and a sister, and none of us graduated from high school. And my mom's goal in life was just to live long enough to go to a graduation, because nobody in the family had ever gotten through high school. We all failed her. We all dropped out. But mom never gave up. As little as we had, suffering through homelessness, the indignities of going to a public hospital to wait on a long line to get care, going to bed at night hungry, going to bed with a toothache because you couldn't go to a dentist. I get it. I walked in those shoes. And maybe that's the bias, if you will, that drives me today, because I've had this extraordinary privilege to break away from that. And so my mom, she struggled. She had some problems with substance. My father did too. He was a good guy, but he had street life. And we'd see him, and I know he loved us, but, you know, he struggled. But mom held the kids together, never gave up. Abuelita, grandma, made sure we didn't have food. She'd come down from her tenement place, bring us food. The apartment was only $38 a month. We never had a phone. I'd forgotten about that. One day when I was surgeon general, I went back to the grammar school in Harlem that I was in, and they pulled out my record. 
and I and I looked and I saw my mom's writing signing the you know the card that all the kids have, and it said address, and then it said phone, and it said none, and I had forgotten. We never had a phone because we couldn't afford a phone. But mom had this unique dignity, and my grandmother was the same way. My abuelita was only about five feet tall, 90 pounds soaking wet, and was the toughest woman you'd ever want to run into. She had 27 children. My father was the youngest. My mom, her mother unfortunately had a lot of problems, and she was a single child. But mom was committed to ensure that her kids would become successful. Mom would sit at the table, little table, single light bulb hanging from the ceiling and a wire in this kitchen. It was a tiny little apartment. And often she would take this little card out of her pocket, and I mean her purse, like this. And she'd hold it up and she'd say, and she spoke in Spanglish. She said, Richard, this is the most important thing I have in the world, besides you kids. I said, well, what's that, Mom? This is my library card. It connects me to the world. Every day she'd spend hours at the library reading. She taught herself five languages. She knew more about geopolitics than any politician I work with, a certain general, let me tell you. Because she'd come home at night, and my brothers and my sister and I would see her coming back from the library on 145th Street with books under her arms. And we'd go, oh, hell, it's going to be a long night. Because <laughs> she'd make us sit at the table, and she'd ask us about what's communism? What's democracy? Who's running this country? How do they run this country? What's important about that? Like, Mom, we, we don't, well, what's, what's the deal, Mom? This doesn't make it, oh, we're 10, 11, 12 years old. We had no idea, and as Mark Twain said about his father, I realize as every year goes by how much I miss her and how much I realize she was an extraordinary, gifted, emancipated, forward-thinking woman but came way before her time because she would talk about these concepts that we have memorialized today. She would talk about the differences us in us brown people and us black people. And in the hood where I grew up, there were no white faces. It was all black and brown. My block, if you found a high school graduate, it was a reportable event, OK? It didn't happen. And why? Because people were worried about surviving. You know, they talk about living paycheck to paycheck. We live day to day. You never know when the sheriff's going to put that thing up because you didn't pay the rent. OK, you're out. One day I came home from grammar school, and there was all the furniture in the street. Think about it the indignity of that. Think about the indignity of hoping somebody will help you. What's the horizon you see for your future? That still exists today in our country. And whether you have a heart and you want to do the right thing to help our fellow men and women, that's wonderful. But if you're a hardcore, hardcore businessman and you, you don't care, then I'll make an economic argument for you why you should address those issues, because ultimately we all pay for them. That debt is spread among all of us in our insurance, however we pay everything else. So running the streets, I learned a lot. Dropped out of high school. Counselors never gave up on me. My emancipation was enlisting in the Army at 17 years old, because I had no place else to go. Who else would take a 17-year-old with no education, no training, no experience, and give you a chance? And that's what the Army did for me. Once you get to boot camp, they don't care if you're rich, you're poor, you're ugly, you're handsome, you're all dummies. They, they, the drill sergeant's telling you, I don't know what's going to happen with our country when they keep selling me you kind of people to take care of our country. <laughs> but somehow, several months later, you come out the other end and you're a citizen, not just a soldier, but they teach you about duty and honor and country and the responsibility you have as a citizen to serve your country. You don't realize it at the time as a kid. And of course, when I went to the recruiter to talk to him, he said, oh, yeah, Carmona, yeah, yeah, take these tests. And I came back and he said, man, you're really smart. If you just sign this paper, we're going we're gonna to take care of you. We'll make you all you can be. Now, what I know in retrospect, 1967, any warm body who showed up qualified, okay? You didn't have to pass the test because Vietnam was booming and they needed bodies to go downrange. And many of us, the 200 kids that were on the train that left Penn Station in New York City in 19, late 67, 68, and we opened our eyes in Columbia, South Carolina. Boy, was it a rude awakening, okay? 
we had to stay together in groups. Because when you went to town, believe it or not, it was just they hadn't heard about what Teddy, what Teddy Kennedy and the Kennedys and the civil rights stuff. I mean, we were looking at the signs with these ugly things on it. We were looking at people having to get off the street because somebody was coming and they weren't the right color. I was like, what the hell is this all about? Remember, we had never been out of our hood. It's a very comfortable place. But once we got outside, it was a rude awakening. And, and because we were a little darker than everybody else, we weren't treated very nicely. But it's OK. We learned from it. One of the great things about the military, it's a great equalizer. Because once you get on a, in a unit, and they send you down range, you go into combat or something, the color doesn't make any difference. The party doesn't make any difference. Don't care if you go to church, you don't go to church. You earn the right to be there. And as I think back on all of my teammates in combat, I didn't know what party they were. I didn't know what religion they were. But I did know we were all Americans. And that's what our government sent us down to do, to represent our country. And that was the beauty of it is, you put all that stuff aside, we're Americans. With that in mind, I thought I was going to make the military career. I, I went to air, jump school, special forces, became a special forces medic weapon specialist. I thought, this is it. I'm going to stay there my whole life. But my team kept urging me to go to college. Lost a lot of good friends in Vietnam. Still go to the wall and cry when I'm over there. Some of those guys die with you. I was lucky. I came home. I got wounded, but I came home. I figured this was going to be my career, but I couldn't. I wanted to do more. Eventually, they harassed me so much, I would apply to, apply to college, but only because I wanted them to leave me alone. They didn't know the secret. I had an Army GED, but I didn't have SATs or PSATs. So I applied. I knew I was going to get rejected. They'd leave me alone. It'd be humbling once, and that'd be the end of it. And I did get rejected from every college. And then one day, I got a letter from Bronx Community College that said, congratulations, you've been accepted. I was like, oh, hell, what am I going to do now? I mean, <laughs> what am I going to do in college? I was a good soldier. I got promoted. I was in charge of stuff. I knew my job, but I didn't know how to be a student. And you know how I got in? The high school counselor who took care of me in high school had never forgotten about me. He kept sending me letters in Vietnam. And he said, Rich, you can do great things. Don't give up. I have his letters still. He since his past. The last one he sent me was, if you make it back alive, you need to go to college. I, I've been, con been in contact with his kids and grandkids since to thank them for their dad, who's not around anymore. He's the one that opened the door and, and found this open enrollment program for Vietnam veterans. And I went, and I, you know, I was humble, going to school the first year with smart kids and having to take remedial courses. Having had experiences that none of them have, so I've been seeing death and dying and the inequities of war and how it doesn't solve anything. Worked lots of jobs, you've heard. Been a police officer, paramedic, registered nurse, physician assistant, uh, teacher, uh, ocean lifeguard. Are you all thinking, hell, it's just a guy who couldn't keep a job. But <laughs> Let me tell you, um, you just keep moving. The only difference between a person that fails and succeeds is the one that succeeds gets up one more time. And all those jobs made a living for me. But more importantly, when I came into the position of Surgeon General of the United States with two wars, having partially responsibility for national preparedness, understanding terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, and all of those things, I had walked in all of those shoes from the bottom to the top and really understood how a community and a nation and a world has to come together. So somehow, God, or as we call him in the military, the jump master, took care of me and gave me all these experiences because ultimately, when I got the big job, I really understood of how all those dots got connected. I did okay in college, became an A student, worked all those jobs. People thought I was a lot smarter than I was. I wasn't. Honest to God, I'm an average person, but I am disciplined better than most. I am focused. I know how to complete a mission. Learned that in the Army. But I look smarter than I was, because while everybody else was trying to figure out so-called metaphorical trees in the forest, I had GPS coordinates on every tree. I knew exactly where I needed to go and what I needed to do. And so eventually, I sent a, I sent a note to my mom. I said, Mom, I'm sorry I failed you. You know, I never got out of high school, but you know, I'm going I'm to get out of college. I thought I'd do something lofty. I'm going to apply to medical school. I really liked science, and I did well. Went to medical school, got accepted to many of them, went to UC San Francisco. I skipped my last year. I graduated number one in my class. 
And then I went and trained as a general vascular surgeon, subspecialized in trauma burns and critical care. I don't hold being a surgeon against me, because you know, if you ask a surgeon to name the best three surgeons in the world, they always have trouble naming the other two. <laughs> and so, so uh, I thought I was going to do that forever, but the important point in all of this is, after doing that for a decade, I recognized that almost everything I was taking care of, running a trauma and emergency medical system, almost everything I took care of every day was preventable. Gunshot wounds, stab wounds, drug deals gone bad, domestic violence, car crashes, people eat the wrong foods, obesity, type 2 diabetes, strokes. It's like, so you came in, you got a pulse, I'm going to resuscitate you on my team. And we send you back home, and what do you do? You go do the same bad things, and you come back again. And this is important, because I'm going to give you some data that will illustrate why it's so important to embrace these concepts that Steve's is talking about and the Candace Health Foundation is talking about. Because it's what not only we need, we meaning here in Kansas, but the nation needs, the world needs today. And I'll make that business case for you in just a minute. So, after doing that transition as a professor, went back to graduate school at night, got a master's degree. I thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I started getting more involved in public health. I ran a public hospital, a health system, did a lot of big things. And then I got a call. It was on a, late one night on, a, on, a, on my voicemail and said, uh, Dr. Carmona, this is. He said, will you give us a call? We'd like to talk to you about a job. And it was White House personnel. And of course, I started laughing, thinking, you know, these cops and firemen I work with will stop at nothing for, you know, embarrassing me. <laughs> so I called the next day. He said, yes, sir, uh, we are recruiting. And uh, would you be willing to go back on active duty? I said, well, maybe. What's the job? He said, the president will be announcing this week he's recruiting for a new United States Surgeon General. I'd like to know, would you like to be considered? I remember holding the phone and laughing, and I thought, there's another Rich Carmona in the country, you know? So <laughs> I'm going to say yes. I'm a smart street kid. I'll go do a few interviews. In a couple of weeks, they'll figure out they got the wrong guy. I'll come home. I have a job. No downside. And I went through the process, and after a few months, I was the last guy standing. Uh, as evidenced by one morning, I got a call from my colleagues that said at 6 in the morning, I'm, the phone's going, uh, the pager, and the, the, back then it was a pager, uh, was going off the hook. And they said, Rich, did, did you read this morning's paper? I said, no, no, what happened? They said, you're on the front page. I said, I didn't do it. I don't care what they got on there. I didn't do it. They said, no, they said you're on the short list to be Surgeon General of the United States. Never tell you how short the list is. You go through. And eventually, one afternoon, I got a call, and it was the president's chief of staff. And I knew then they, that was the rejection call. That, Carmona, you're a good guy. You served your country. You did all these great things. But you know we're going to take Joe and not Rich and so on. And he said, uh, Rich, uh, what, we'd like to know uh, what uh, you, your family, uh, what your kids are doing on March 26th. And I thought, heck, if they interview my kids, I'm never going to get the job. So <laughs> I thought. He said, no, no, I, I really would like to know what you and your family are doing because the president has made his decision this morning and uh, he would like you and your family to come to the White House on March 26th where he's going to have a press conference and he will announce that you will be the nominee for Surgeon General of the United States. And I said something brilliant. I said, you're shitting me. <laughs> and, and he said, no, sir, I'm not. <laughs> so... So you go there, and it's a surreal moment. You know, you're on the other side of the velvet rope. You can touch things down instead of keeping on moving and all of that. And, <laughs> and sitting in the Oval Office waiting for the president, and you go out, and he says to me, he says, okay, we're going to go out. I'm going to say some nice things about you. And then he looks at me and says, now, when you talk, you can say nice things about me. And I said, yes, Mr. President, sure. It was wonderful, but 10 minutes, it's over. Then you have to go to Senate confirmation, and Senate confirmation is equally uh, tough, uh, intrusive, sometimes malicious. Uh, sometimes, as you, many of you know, you can be on the list to, for a, a position like this because the president doesn't appoint you. The president asks Congress permission if you can serve. And if you don't get your hearing, that's the way Congress tells the president, we don't like your guy. And if you can get a hearing, and sometimes you get treated like a pinata and you wish you didn't get the hearing. <laughs> I met all these senators, and then eventually they gave me the, they gave me the privilege to, um, to come before the Senate for a Senate confirmation hearing after several months. I did. I showed up. I was there a little early. I, I was 10 minutes early in the Senate anteroom. I was going back and forth pacing, diaphoretic, tachycardic, you know, because it's, it's like taking your boards in public. Every media guy's there, and they don't love you. They're looking for a YouTube moment. They want tomorrow's headline. And so 
as I was getting ready to go out, um, senior senator came out to see me, who was the chair of my confirmation committee, shook my hand, thanked me, said, I thank you for your willingness to come back on active duty, serve your country. I said, Senator, hey, it's, and it was, Sen it was Teddy Kennedy. And, and he said, um, he said, you know, it's, it, this can be very tough. My friends sometimes are polarized and they use people like you to get their messages out in the confirmation hearing. But don't take it personal. It's politics. I said, okay, Senator, I'm a tough kid. I'm from the block. It's all right. And we went in. I had my Senate confirmation hearing. Took a little over two hours. And I became the first Surgeon General in the history of the United States to be confirmed unanimously by the U.S. Senate. Then... Well, now you got the job, and the job is to protect, promote, and advance the health, safety, and security of the United States. Deceivingly simple on paper, extraordinarily difficult to execute in a hyperpartisan, dysfunctional political environment, where every one of the things that you're talking about here today that has a scientific reason to move forward, all of a sudden becomes partisan. And that gridlock is killing us, as you know. When I had... My confirm just be as I had my confirmation hearing, when Teddy Kennedy spoke to me, before I went in, he said to me, uh, I want to give you some advice. I said, uh, Senator, anything that you can tell me will help me get through this arduous process would be greatly appreciated. He said, uh, eh, Rich, it's not going to help you today, but keep in your back pocket because I think you're going to make it, and if you do, it'll help you understand what you're getting into. I said, okay, Senator. So uh, we kept talking, and I said to him, Senator, it's 9 o'clock. i got to get inside. I mean, I can't be late for this. He said, Rich, I chaired a committee. They can't start without me. <laughs> he said, Rich, you might have heard this before. Like I said, put it in your back pocket. I, he says, uh, Rich, when you come to Washington, if you want a friend, you need to bring a dog. That's what he said to me. And I said, oh, Harry Truman, right? I said, yeah, I understand. He squeezed my hand, he looked me in the eye, and he said, you're clueless. <laughs> I was. There's nothing that prepares you for that, for really, that battle space. That con it, it, it is a battle space, believe it. You're safer in combat some days, because at least you know where the enemy is and where the rounds are coming from. But after my confirmation and several years later, certain generals testify a lot on the Hill. I was testifying, and, um, and there was a terrorism meeting about some uh, future things we needed to do to protect the nation from bioterrorism. And Teddy happened to be there. The meeting was delayed, and I always would go up and shake hands with the senators and thank them. And Teddy had kind of befriended me, and we had a nice ongoing relationship where he'd call me for advice, and I would, you know, call, reach him sometimes to ask him for help. And I went over to him, and I said, and this is, I'm on the job about three years now. I said, uh, Senator, nice to see you again. You know, he said, how's your family? How, how's yours? And, and I said, I want to tell you, thank you so much for how kind you were to me again. He says, oh, Rich, you thank me all the time. You don't have to do that. No. I said, no, but thank you for the advice. He smiled. He said, you mean about the dog, right? I said, yes, Senator, I do. He says, you understand now, don't you? I said, Senator, I do, and respectfully, I disagree with you. He said, well, how can you do He was aghast. He said, how can you disagree? I said, Senator, it's I'm a smart street kid. I've been here a few years, and it's come to my attention that when you come to Washington, if you need a friend, you've got to bring at least two dogs. <laughs> and, and he said, well, why? I don't understand. I said, because during your tenure, at least one of those dogs is going to turn on you. <laughs> he laughed, and he, and he gave me a hug, and he says, it's right on the Senate floor, he says, that's better advice than I gave you. Can I use that from now on with the new, <laughs> with the new people coming in? So... That's the vantage point I came to being Surgeon General and maybe the biases I had for understanding what the social determinants of health are, what health equity is, what social justice and injustice is. I mean, I understand what it's like to be called ugly names because you're a little darker than the people around you. I know what it's like to have the indignities of being poor and being hungry and not getting health care. And what bothers me in the richest nation of the world, it still exists today. And it's incumbent upon all of us to do something, whatever we decide to do, to do something to make it better. That's not asking for welfare, it's really asking for empowerment. What Tanya and I were talking about this morning, it's about my mom never took welfare. She never did. She said, I'm not taking that. I'm not going to do it. My people don't do that. But she sought to empower her kids to do better. And she did everything she could to empower her children, to get an education which will set you free. 
which will let you do what you want, which will let you have a nice home. You don't have to live like this. It's up to us to give opportunity, because that's what our nation is about. Give people a hand up. As one social worker told me years ago when I was working a night shift as a nurse and a paramedic, and she said, Carmona, you know, you're a pretty smart kid. I want you to remember something. She said, when you take the elevator to the top floor, you send it down for somebody else. Never forgot that. Never forgot that. And that's what you're all here for. Okay, you're up there. You took that elevator. But now you're here to make sure somebody else gets on that elevator and we do the right thing. And I always quote Spike Lee, you know, who always said that. Do the right thing. It sounds real simple, but it's about doing the right thing. So, if you look at my zip code, which is Harlem, 10031, you would predict that nobody's going to come out of there alive or doing anything that's significant because of the social determinants of health being in the wrong area. My portfolio as Surgeon General, which is what you present to Congress and the President to say, this is what I want to spend my time doing, was number one about prevention. Today we're spending nearly $3 trillion on what we call health care. It is not health care, folks. It's sick care. Make no mistake. That's 19% of our gross domestic product. Almost one in five dollars is being spent on this. But what's important that you need to understand, of every one of those single dollars that are spent, 75 to 80 cents are spent on chronic diseases that we cause. Think about it. 80% of your dollars. So, all the things I mentioned that I saw as a trauma surgeon that drove me to go into public health are still here today. So whether you make bad decisions today that you get involved in crimes or shooting and stabbing, drunk driving, all of that, or whether you don't take care of yourself and you become obese and you smoke and you get heart disease and you get cancer, that's where it's going to. If you look at the NIH budget, which is $30 billion, one of the best research places in the world, when you look at where their dollars are spent, a great deal of the dollars are spent on diseases trying to find cures for diseases that we cause. Do you know that if we eliminated tobacco, 80% of lung cancer would go away? Four out of five lung cancer cases go away. If we ate a healthy diet, exercised every day, came, kept our weight proportionate to our height, and, engage, and stopped engaging in high-risk activities, we could eliminate half of all cancers. Think about that, just through prevention. So look at tobacco, the number one preventable cause of death in our nation. Almost a half a million people a year die from tobacco-related causes. And that doesn't count the millions more who suffer irreparable harm from emphysema, cancer, oral health diseases. I mean, the list is endless. Can't, tobacco drives all of that. But up until recently, our government subsidized tobacco farmers. And it was like, Surgeon General, keep America healthy. Okay, dude, why are you giving the bad guys the money then? It just didn't make any sense. So recently they've cut that back. But I mean, still, it's, it's an amazing thing. Now, let's look at obesity, which is now eclipsing tobacco. Two out of three Americans are overweight or obese. We have millions of children, millions and millions of children who are overweight or obese. Type 2 diabetes is rampant in our country. So you say, oh, okay, that's okay, you can treat that. Sure we can. But with obesity, type 2 diabetes, and a smoker, you're going to have cancer, you're going to have emphysema, you're going to have diabetes. You know, the list is endless. So when you just look at tobacco, and you look at uh, obesity, those two only, about a half a trillion dollars in direct and indirect costs to the nation. That's a big part of your budget, folks. We wouldn't have a problem. So we have to get a handle on this. And the other part of what I like, what you all are doing in Kansas, you talk about engagement. We can't solve the problem by just writing a paper and telling them to do this. It doesn't work. We have to work with the community, and the community has to be able to understand that they have an obligation to try and pursue optimal health and wellness. Never to smoke. Walk a little every day. But if you live in one of these food deserts, and mom's on food stamps, and you're struggling, it ain't that easy. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I understand. So it's up to us to make sure that the infrastructure is in place to be able to address the greater this divide that continues with the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. That's just not my opinion. Whether you look at it economically or health-wise, those are the numbers. That's what the numbers tell us. So what you guys are doing is the right thing. But we can't forget it's not as easy as a memo. It's about doing certain things that I'm going to talk about right now. 
Prevention, for the reasons I mentioned, obviously has to be first in that portfolio, and that's what I did. Preparedness, I won't spend much time on, but lack of health becomes a preparedness issue when the Army has to have a pre-boot camp now to get youngsters who can't pass the physical to pass the physical to then join the Army. And it, you know, the basic physical is pretty minor, kind of like you can walk fast and have a pulse. It ain't a real difficult thing. But now we have a pre-boot camp for that. And when I was Surgeon General and we had 40% of our National Guard and our reserve officers and soldiers in combat and something like Katrina hits, well then who do you call to help? Who does the governor call to mobilize when half your troops are someplace around the world and you have an earthquake or you have a flood like in Katrina? So these health issues intersect directly with national preparedness every day. And in fact, when I was trying to get traction on these things with, with press conferences, everybody wanted to talk to me about terrorism and weapons of mass destruction, which are important. But one day a young reporter said to me, so Surgeon General, and this was at a terrorism press conference, he says, what is the most pressing problem you have? I said, obesity. They all looked at me like I was smoking something. What is he talking about? I said, obesity is the terror within. Some of you may remember that headline. I got in trouble for it. Um, well, because... I recognized after my first year, I had to figure out a way to be able to communicate better to, to, to get my message across because the reporters are all looking for tomorrow's story. And if you get up there like a professor and start explaining things, everybody goes to sleep. But if I can capture it in a sound bite, and then they print that sound bite, then it gets a life. Because the next day I get a call from the White House from my friend who's the press secretary and says, yo, what's this thing you're doing, a terror within? That, that's our brand. Terror is what we're talking about. I said, well, let me tell you about terror within. And so they weren't happy that I used it, but I had to steal some of the thunder so that I could get my message out because, you know, on 9-11, we lost 3,000 great people. I mean, I mean, it was a horrible, horrible thing in a terrorist event. But every day we lose millions of people, okay, because of these bad habits, and we have to put it in perspective. So health ties in with preparedness. Last example would be when we arrive in Katrina and we look at one of the poorest socioeconomic areas geographically in the United States that are underwater now where many people of color live, many people of color who have low education, who are unemployed, lots of single moms, lots of disease, lots of obesity, lots of type 2 diabetes, lots of cardiovascular disease. And we show up. Literally, we had to evacuate 300,000 people. Biggest emergency management we ever done in the whole world, in, in, in our country. But when we tried to categorize these patients, and people would come to us with a bag of pills in water, where we set up emergency care, and we said, well, tell us about your disease. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I take this blue pill because sugar disease. And they told me my heart doesn't work, so I have to take the red pill. We had no pharmacies. Walmart, CVS, and others flew stuff in, and we had to just treat empirically because we didn't know. Think about the disease burden and what that cost to the nation. Had I had 300,000 healthy people, they could have been part of the rescue effort. But now they became an added problem to, because of those social determinants of health, because of their poor health status. So make no mistake, this all intersects with national preparedness as well as the health issues. Prevention, preparedness, health disparities. Spent a lot of time on that for the reasons that you, I've exposed my biases. We're a nation divided by our health metrics. If you're African American, Hispanic American, Native American, or poor, you will have less health care, you'll have more complications, you'll cost society more, and you'll die sooner. Those are absolute statistics. It's not my opinion. People have reported on this for decades. And if we don't do something about it, we're all going to drown in this debt that's accumulating because so much of this is preventable. We're the worst health disparities in our nation, folks. People you say, oh, it's where you grew up in Harlem, Carmona, or it's in East LA. It's not. The worst health disparities in our nation are in places called reservations. Go on an Indian reservation and you think you're in a third world country. These are the original Americans, folks. How'd they get there? We conquered them. We took them away from their ability to hunt and gather. We took them away from their organic foods, which they ate. There was no obesity in those populations, okay? They were physically active through the lifespan. So think about all the things we're telling people to do today. That's what the American Indians did back then. But we take them off their land, we repatriate them someplace else in some desolate areas we call reservations, and then we feed them excess U.S. Department of Agriculture food. 
which is filled with fat and salt. So the worst obesity epidemic today is on the reservation, where adolescent suicide is two to three times that of what it is in the United States with the average Anglo kid. Homelessness, divorce rates, single moms, vaccination rates, high school dropout rates over 60%. This is a place that's imploding, and yet they are our responsibility. These are the original Americans, okay? They've been isolated. If they could just do what they used to do, is farm the land, and what did they, they ate? Farm to table. They stayed physically active. They worked in clans. They took care of one another. They were socially interactive. All the things we tell the world that they need to do today to create these blue zones, which are maximally healthy, they did. We took it away, and what's happened over the last century is to look at an experiment. What happens when you rob somebody of their culture, their ability to interrelate, their ability to grow their food and act healthily? There it is. It's before us, and we're paying the price for that now, and I, I know it because of my, part of my responsibility is for the Indian Health Service. So prevention preparedness, health literacy, and, and cultural competence is extremely important. We have an extraordinary amount of science today that the world has never seen before. From genomics, epigenetics, nutrigenomics, pharmacogenomics, it's exploding. How do we take that complex stuff and translate it in a culturally competent, health literate manner to that end user, a fellow citizen that we call a patient, to do one thing only, effect sustainable behavioral change. That's all it is. Walk a little more, don't eat that stuff, never smoke, wear a seatbelt, wear a helmet. Simple messages, but the science is so complicated today. And yet, it's up to us to figure out how to translate that, and that's where engagement comes in. Engagement doesn't go shaking a hand and say, here's my memo, be healthy. Engagement is insinuating yourself in that community, winning the hearts and minds of the opinion leaders in that community, having them see that your heart is in the right place and you really wanna do this, like you guys did years ago. I'm so proud of what you did. I mean, it brought tears to my eyes when I heard it today. But that's what you have to do. You gotta get in the community. You have to earn the trust of the people. Then you can start moving them. The mistake we made for decades in public health is say, oh, I have the answer. Let me tell you what you need to do. That doesn't fly. You get in the community, you become part of the people. You walk with them. You hang with them. You eat their food. Then you start moving along. In the military, we call it PSYOPs, psychological operations, okay? But all it comes down to is Make a relationship. Once you make that relationship, you can get stuff done. You can inspire people to do more. I spent a lot of time on global health and what we call health diplomacy. Because whether you know it or not, we are inextricably tied to the rest of the world. The world is flatter now. There's over 7 billion people. We make up only 320 million. We're a speck. But yet, we consume more and waste more than anybody else in the world. And yet, we have so many good things in this country. But when I looked at this from a Surgeon General standpoint and I thought, all these border arguments and everything, they're superfluous. Because the fact is, the threats and challenges we face as a nation do not respect our geopolitical borders. Think Zika virus, think AIDS, think SARS, and think obesity, think tobacco. Borders are meaningless. The fact is, borders are necessary so we can divide certain things, but we need to trade across borders as economic issues, as health issues. We need to deal with our borders much smarter and stop being biased and stop being discriminatory and recognize that the reason the United States is so strong is our diversity and paradoxically it's what divides us every day. That's the challenge before us, to move ahead of that. So global health is extremely important. So in closing. The Kansas Health Foundation has embarked on a bold and necessary journey to be positively disruptive, to challenge the norm, to reshape our reality. And that has to be done. It's about reshaping that reality, aptly named. The reality is that without fully understanding the social determinants of health and health equity, we will never fully be able to pursue optimal health and wellness and thereby decrease morbidity and mortality and improve the quality and quantity of life. The people that are spending time on digitalizing and getting more efficient hospitals, that's all important. But think about it. Let's say you take, any, you take any of your hospitals here, any of your practices. Let's say you made them maximally efficient, that the guys from every you know, university, Harvard and others, come and say, this is the best practice. If you ain't dealing with the public, all you will be doing now is better managing sicker people. That's what's going to happen. So the public has to be engaged for those reasons. 
It is time for all of us nationally to embrace the model here, since the trajectory we are on tells us that the legacy we leave our children will be unsustainable if we don't change what we do. I believe Einstein once told us not to expect change if we continue to do the same thing. And in closing, I'll paraphrase Winston Churchill, who said, I love Americans. They always do the right thing, eventually. And eventually is here, and the future has caught us, and we have no choice. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. I think the boss has said it was okay for a few minutes to do some questions. So, anyway, yes, sir. Okay. And uh, thank you for your service, and um, I'm sure your your mom and your abuelita would be bien orgulloso de usted en este, en este día. Um, so many times, especially, and I've written my question down so I didn't forget it. Um, so especially given this political war and climate that we're in, right, our communities are used as pawns and are told to be happy with whatever piecemeal approach we're given or offered to help our community, right? Whether it's around health care, immigration reform, or whatever other issues are oppressing our communities. Um, what do we, what can we do to ensure that we don't have to be satisfied or happy with whatever piecemeal approach um, that we're given as a solution instead of the entire solution? And similarly, um, something that Steve Cohen showed um, with that picture of the fence and the kids and the boxes, um, how do we remove the fence so that the, the fence, which are those social and systemic barriers that contribute to inequality, social injustice, discrimination, and what lead our communities to be happy with whatever piecemeal approach we're given? Great, you know, great questions. Um, people write PhD theses on, on that. So uh, my, my sense is we the people have the power if we exercise that power. The fact is, is that many of the people who are on the, the lower social determinants of health, uh, the bottom part of our country, if you will, who are struggling, they feel disenfranchised. They don't think their vote makes a difference. Why bother? Nobody cares. They don't listen to me. Those rich guys are going to do what they want. I hear it all the time. But I mean, together, we can affect change. But that means that the best thing we can do is educate our children so that they understand. You know, my mom told me that, and she was right. You know, one of the things my mom told me, uh, I should have mentioned it earlier, but um, it's germane to this question. She'd sit down and she'd start almost grilling us, you know, in, in, the, in the apartment there. And, and we were, we couldn't understand why. And one, I remember one thing she said to me one day, and I didn't understand it. It was mid-60s. I was just a little kid. She said, Richard, you don't understand this, but let me tell you something. And I want to put it in perspective, because that was a time when, before people wrote about Venus and Mars and estrogen and testosterone and the difference between men and women and all of that. My mom said to me in Spanglish, she said, the world will be a safer, better, healthier place when women have an equal seat at the table of leadership. Never forgot that. And today we've come to that. It's a half a century later. Okay? But I, and I mean, and that, it's, it's about empowerment. It's about empowerment. It's about people standing up. Look at the examples we just saw with these brave kids over half a century ago putting their life on the line and saying, we're not going to take this anymore. But that's what has to happen. It doesn't necessarily have to be a protest because there's enough of us. I mean, let's face it. In another 20 or 30 years, this is not going to be an Anglo country. Okay? It will be a brown country. Okay? And the, and the issues are, do we want to wait till then? Or do we want to start having our voice heard? It's not about getting control. It's about having an equal seat at the table. And I think we all need to stand up. We all need to vote. We all need to be in, get involved in politics. We need to bring up people like you and others who are willing to take a position on a city council or a board of supervisors. We need to have better representation that reflects the diversity of our nation. We don't see that now. Look at Congress. 535 people. You got a couple of blacks, you got a couple of Hispanics, but there's not a lot. Okay, and you look at city, you look at county, same thing. Once we start to get better representation, it'll work. As a last resort, sure, we can stop the train. Okay, we can do a sit-in, we can do what we have to do if we have to, but I think we should be thoughtful and have a strategy that actually starts to educate our children and get them into the positions there so that eventually 
we become a true America that's colorless. That, that's what I would like to see. Question back there? Yes, ma'am. How are we going to effectively include patient advocates in healthcare decision making? Because patient advocates are often at the leading cutting edge of almost everything related to their particular expertise areas. Smart leaders understand that it's important to bring in the community advocates at any level. As Surgeon General, uh, most of what I did, almost every meeting, was to bring in the constituent groups and say, tell me how you see the world. So it's smart. I think that um, if you don't do that, you miss the opportunity to really have that grassroots understanding of what the problems are. You may agree or disagree, but it's looking through that lens at a different way and having people tell you what their experiences are rather than the top guessing what it's like. So I am a strong advocate for that, and I think all leaders um, do that. You know, I, I still teach at the War College uh, where we teach, admiral, we teach senior officers to become admirals and generals. And one of the things that we spend time on is listening to your troops. Listen to the private, listen to the sergeant, listen to the young officers. Because at the level you live where the oxygen's a little thinner, as an admiral or general, you're not actually seeing what's going on. So bringing in the young officers. And so like when I, as a Surgeon General, I'm an admiral, I spend a lot of time with my subordinate officers asking those questions. And smart leaders understand that. And smart leaders also understand the best thing you can do to be an effective leader is surround yourself by trusted people who are smarter than you. And, and, and you'll, you'll be able to be successful. Yes, ma'am. community and most of the researchers that come into our communities we have three major population areas in southwest Kansas that are minority majorities we continue to have people that come in and do all their research in English only and I want and I think we don't get a true picture of what's really going on in those communities the underserved populations I'm talking about would you be an advocate uh, to uh, promote and increase more multilingual research so we get a true picture of the health and well-being of those underserved populations? Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's not just multilingual, but I, I, I broaden it because it's not only language, it's culture. Okay, truly understanding the culture. So if I'm dealing in the Hispanic community uh, with an obesity epidemic, which is pretty common, okay, if I just understand your language and I can speak to you in Spanish, that doesn't help. Okay, but I need to know, what'd your, how'd your grandma teach you to cook? Okay, tell me how much lard you put into that food. I mean, you gotta get real granular because the cultures are often the driver and the people are very resistant to changing those cultures. So yes, language is important, but cultural competence is extraordinarily important. And again, to your point, as a little boy, you know, I spoke English. When I was a little boy, you know, all my aunts and uncles, all they spoke was Spanish. But here's the problem. All of us would not speak Spanish outside because there was so much discrimination. So I forgot how to, speak. I understand everything, but I have to think about what to say, it's not spontaneous. My abuelita, who never spoke English, she used to say to me, Ricardo, si tiene hambre, necesita que pida mi en español. Which, said, which means, if you're hungry, you gotta ask me in Spanish, okay? She used to say. <laughs> and I never understood why that was important because she was proud of her culture. And she said, don't shy away, but when you're out in the streets, and people are singling you out with bad names because you are one of those people. So my generation lost part of the culture, lost part of the language because of that discrimination. And so it's truly essential to understand the experience of the populations so that you can insinuate yourself there and not, not just become an advocate. I say it's better than that. It's become part of the family, that they trust you. Uh, hello, my name is Tatiana Lena. I'm with the Kansas Health Institute. Thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. I have a question about uh, engagement of multiple sectors, as we have been working very hard in public health to get better at this. My question is for you, how do we make a compelling argument for business sector, for transportation sector, for other sectors to really invest in prevention, really care about prevention, and as well as really consider health implications in their decision making? What are some of the effective strategies from your perspective? Thank, thank you for the question, and um, so let me, let me uh, tell you a couple of things. I mentioned early on 
One of the things that I learned as Surgeon General when I'd go before different constituencies, I could have a scientific argument, but I needed to have an economic argument in my back pocket, okay? Because some people don't respond to the fact that we just have poor people that are suffering, okay? Because I, I, I'm going to tell you people, it's elected officials say they need to get a job. We've had enough welfare. So, but then I'm ready with my economic argument to say, Congressman, Senator, I understand what you're saying. You know, and, and what I'm not advocating for welfare. I'm advocating for smart investment in our tax dollars to empower people to make a taxpayer out of this person, okay, so that they can go on. And so I can make the economic argument or the science argument. So let, let's look at that. Um, when I talk to businesses, one of the biggest problems that businesses have today are the rising cost of health care. Small businesses are getting killed. Even the large businesses are cutting back. So either they reduce your formulary or they reduce the menu of benefits while they raise your, your payments for your, for your health care. So what literature, what science do we have that will allow us to say something positive? Well, the literature is pretty clear that depending on the programs, if you do it right, for every dollar invested in prevention, you get a three to five dollar return. But it doesn't happen in the first year because it's, it's an acculturation that takes place. So however you do it with positive or negative incentives, which we see in the, in the, in the workplace today. So if you're overweight, if you have diabetes, and you're trying to do better, okay, we'll cover your health care costs, okay, or your co-pays. There's a whole bunch of deals. But what if you ignore it and you say, I don't want to exercise? Well, then why should I accept the burden of the cost of your care if you don't want to be a partner with me? So these prevention programs do work, and more and more we're seeing it happen. A lot of it is being driven because insurance companies are now starting to stratify risk. Okay, they have for a long time in, in like automobile insurance. If you crash your car, your rates go up, right? If you do it two or three times, they won't insure you. Well, now in health, they have to insure you because of the Affordable Care Act. But the truth is, somebody has to pay for that. So unless the citizens become engaged, if the cost continues to go up, then the Affordable Care Act just becomes an expensive place to provide care. So that's why I kept saying that prevention has to become part of it. You can make the economic argument for prevention in the workspace. You can make the economic argument for prevention globally in the national budget where we're spending 19% of our GDP. Because as I said to you, 75 to 80 percent of that expenditure is on chronic diseases that we cause. So there's the economic argument at a, at a scale level nationally. You could take it down to a local level with the business, but it's all disease burden and economic burden that we all pay for because the cost of that is spread among all of us. All your premiums. You could be the healthiest guy in Kansas or girl. Your, your insurance rate will go up, not because you've been bad, but because you're paying for everybody else who's bad. And that's the way the, the, the system works today. So there's the economic argument and the scientific argument. Sir? Yes, sir. Um, I'm a recovering journalist. <laughs> and I, I began my career in Louisville, Kentucky, where big tobacco exists. And I had a feeling that if you were to say this in Louisville, Kentucky, where big tobacco rules, there'd be a huge hue and cry outside, and there'd be people waiting on you. But one of the things that I was trying to figure out while you were talking was how do we free people who have their livelihood tied up in big tobacco. Okay. If you raise this issue there, people say you're going to take my job. And interestingly, the people who may need our help most are the people who work at Brown and Williamson and smoke themselves. So we're, we're sort of tied to bad habits, bad companies. Um, how do we extricate ourselves from those influences? It's a great question, and I think that to do that, we have to practice what I would call public health innovation, be an entrepreneur, be willing to be disruptive in the, in the space. And so I give you a tangible example. I did have to deal with this one as Surgeon General, because as Surgeon General, you often have to go before Congress and testify. Now, the irony here is, folks, the first Surgeon General's report that tied cancer to smoking was in 1965 by Luther Terry. Over a half a century later, we still have the plague of tobacco as the biggest killer of Americans, okay? You'd think that maybe we didn't understand. Maybe there wasn't enough science. The science is overwhelming. We've had 31 or 32 Surgeon General reports on tobacco. I've I written a few of them with my team when I was Surgeon General. And yet, because of the information you talk about, it's hard. 
So what I had suggested there was being sensitive to the fact that I didn't want to create an unemployment. I didn't want to put families who were embedded in the tobacco industry, you know, that you have families that have been there for generations growing tobacco. So I said, okay, what if we do this? You guys are subsidizing them to grow the tobacco. Why don't we have a transition over a five or 10 year period? Let's subsidize them to rotate crops and start growing healthy stuff and let's start diminishing tobacco over time. So we keep the work, workforce working. They're still farmers, but they start farming something else. And so, I don't know, I must have, they must have thought I came from a different world. You know, it was like, it, it didn't, but your point is well taken that in order to stop, we need to have some healthy alternatives, okay? And I, I'm sensitive, I don't want to put people out of work, but it was hard to get any traction because as you know, in the tobacco growing states, if you um, are against tobacco, uh, you won't get reelected, or you won't get elected to begin with, okay? Because their argument was always, well, it's people's choice. Yeah, maybe, but the problem is, let me give you an example, which is really, this is true that happened to me. I, this, to, even though we're doing the two wars, weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, all of these diseases, tobacco was on my table every day. I mean, it wasn't a year in my four years in the statutory term I had that we weren't moving forward with one or two tobacco reports. And it always infuriated me, said, why am I spending all this time on this when we already know this stuff kills. It's just like, a, this is silly. When I used to drive uh, in Washington between meetings on the mall, I would stop sometimes, and I have a, sometimes security with me and my aide de camp. And we'd be going to a building. I said, let's go in, because they'd always wanted me to go on the, you know, the private entrance and so nobody could see me. I said, no, I'm gonna go in the front. And they go, oh, you don't wanna do that. I said, yeah, I wanna do it. And, a lot, and right then is when you know, federal buildings started saying people couldn't smoke in the building. So I purposely would go outside. And I'd walk in and you'd see the smokers sitting there. And I'm, Surgeon General, you're in uniform. And in the summer, I got my summer whites on. And I'd go in and I'd always do this on purpose because my aide would go, oh God, there he goes again. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And uh, you see a guy smoking in the doorway. And I go, hey, how are you doing? And uh, I said, I, I'm Rich Carmona, I'm your Surgeon General. He goes, all right. And I said, uh, what are you smoking? And he and said, Let me, can I see the pack of cigarettes? And he takes it out, and I, and I said, now you see this pack of cigarettes, whatever it was? I said, you see, you see down here where it says Surgeon General? I stay up all night and sign these so you don't smoke, man. <laughs> and, and, the guy, and the guy would look at me, and, and, he, and, and here's the interesting thing. I would say three quarters of the people would then feel guilty and go, oh, Surgeon General, man, I've tried to quit. I can't quit. I'm addicted to this stuff. And I'd say, okay, so tell me about what happened. You, you know, how many times and what? And usually it takes a person two, three, four times. So I'd have an 800, and they'd tell me, well, I'm, I'm uninsured, I can't get help. I said, yes, you can. Here's an 800 quit line, okay? Call this line, I guarantee you we're gonna give you help to help you stop smoking. And I'd say three quarters of the persons, they were very happy. But I'd have a quarter of people that would go, I'm an American, you can't tell me what to do. But then, I, then that opens another discussion. I would say, okay, I understand your right, but your individual right is now infringing on the collective right of society. Because well, I'd say, well, how old were you when you started smoking? 15. I'd say, so let me tell you the history. Your lifespan is shortened 14 years now, if you started as an adolescent. Your last 10 years of life, you're going to have cancer, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, God knows how many other things. You can't afford to pay for that. So now your right, I have to pay for. I don't want to pay for your care. You willing to post a bond? Okay, but, but people have to start to realize there are consequences of your rights. And in a democracy, that's what happens. You're always juxtaposing the individual right against the collective right of society. But we have to do it. Other comments, questions, is there? Oh, one there, yes, sir. I'm Sheldon Weisskraut with the Health Reform Resource Project. Uh, what I think is a simple question, maybe. Um, what are some of the techniques that you found effective to address the dysfunction and the divide Politics. So when you were testifying before Congress and half the table was poo-pooing the science and not believing anything you were telling them, how, do you, how did you, what did you use to kind of cut through that and actually make change happen legislatively? It's a great question. Um, it's not an easy issue. I think what you have to do, I mean, and I'll tell you the truth, is that sometimes you're listening to the questions of one of these 535, 100 Senate 435. And you, you listen to this question, and you kind of, and what you want to say, are you freaking kidding me? Do you really believe that? You know? But all, you always have to preface your response by, well, Senator, Congressman, that was a very interesting point. Uh, please allow me to explain, okay? 
and you know, you want to live to fight another day because I would have people call me all the time and say, what happened to you, man? You used to be so passionate about this stuff. Why don't you just tell them what to do? I said, I can do that. People would say to me, Why, just go call a press conference on the Capitol steps and expose them. I said, I can do it, but I get to do it once. Okay? And if it's not big enough that it's going to change the world, I have to be able to fight another day. And I'm going to stay in the fight for the four years to address these issues. I found the most, the most success I had is making sure I spent time that they got to know me personally. It's easy to take shots at somebody when you don't know them. But I was up on the hill a lot. I'd go to offices. And when they needed information, I would provide it. Because here's the interesting thing. As Surgeon General of the United States, you're not the doctor of the Republicans or the Democrats. You're the doctor of the nation. Okay? And I used to joke with them once I knew them. I'd say, you know, we got something in common. We have public positions, you know, a lot of notoriety. But I said, I have something you guys are going to be looking for. And they go, what's that? I said, credibility. Okay? Really, that's what it is. Because I, I tell them, no Surgeon General has ever been indicted for anything. We've never, you know, done malfeasance. We weren't caught in a bathroom with a little boy or a little girl, you know. I mean, you guys take the high road and you do this stuff all the time. You know, and I, but, but when they see that you're not going to be biased, and, and that's the danger of being Surgeon General. Each party tries to co-opt you. Because polling shows that it is one of the most credible positions in the federal government. And so you can pull, you can pull my budget, you can make it hard for me to practice, but you can't take away the credibility of the office. And so you guard that, you know, with your life. Because I want to pass the baton to the guy behind me so the office is in better condition than when I found it because it's not mine. You guys gave me the privilege to serve. And I ain't going to screw it up on my watch. So I make the relationships. So I had great relationships with the most conservative people and the most liberal people, okay? I spent a lot of time with your governor when he was a senator, okay? I didn't agree with a lot of his stuff. But I was there as a doctor of the nation, not a, not a politician. And he'd ask my opinion, I'd tell him the truth. So I think the, the most important thing is establishing yourself as a credible source of information, telling them the truth, but recognizing that they may have already made up their mind and, you don't want, and they don't want to be confused by the truth. Okay? Because once they, as an individual, you can have the honest discussion. But once you're in your party caucus and you have a platform, Often they have to come up with reasons why they can't do it that way. Some legitimate, sometimes not. But for me, I always look through the lens of what's the best science for the people. And that's not Democrat or Republican. And so establishing yourself, gaining the credibility, and being honest with them. And sometimes you can sway the vote, sometimes you can't. You win some, you lose some. Others? Yes, sir. Ordering on a theocracy, how do you counter specifically uh, faith-based arguments with scientific arguments and reach that, that those communities? So, so uh, just to correct one thing you said, I, I wasn't appointed. The, pres the president nominates you, and then the Senate is the one that gives you the permission to serve. Okay, so a lot of people think they just give you the job. At the jobs at that level, you have to go before the Senate. The president asks permission, and that's the, you know, the division of the three parts of government. So it's a very good question, and I dealt with it quite often. But as Surgeon General, I'm not a theologian. I look at the science. But I appreciate and respect all religions because we're in a democracy. And I take care of you, whether you're an atheist, a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim, whether you pray to a tree, whether you don't pray, doesn't make a difference to me, okay? Because I'm the doctor of the nation. As a trauma surgeon, I never had somebody come into the trauma room with a gunshot wound and ask for a Republican trauma surgeon or a Democratic one, right? They want their butt saved. In fact, I'll digress for a second. A very famous story. When President Reagan got shot, and, the, 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 and he went into Georgetown, uh, to GW, to the trauma center, a guy named Giordano, who's the chief, he's since retired, and he's very jovial, and he was, oh, you know, very gregarious guy. He's on the gurney. His blood pressure is very low. He's in shock. They're working him up, and Doc comes over to him and says, Mr. President, we have to take you to the operating room. You're bleeding into your chest. Your blood pressure's 70. If we don't get the bleeding stopped, you're going to die. President Reagan grabs Dr. Giordano's hand and says, Doctor, okay, but I hope you're all Republicans. <laughs> and Dr. Giordano said, Mr. President, today we are all Republicans. <laughs> that was the right answer. So I think you have to understand that in a diverse nation, we, the beauty of democracy is you can believe in what you want to believe in, okay? Are the Native Americans who have several gods for rain and crops any different than a Christian who goes to church? No, that's their right to be able to worship that way. 
So I stay focused on the science. Now, as far as faith-based community, I work with the faith-based community a lot because often I found that the best way to get my message out, I need a distribution network. So for me to go to a church in the south side of some town where it's largely Hispanic or African-American, perfect example, in Katrina, when we had those 300,000 people, I was like, how do I get the message out? Everybody's on the water, people are dying. They had a coalition of all of the Baptist churches. I went to the head preacher. And I said, can I share the bully pulpit with you on Sunday because I need to talk to the people? And will you give me the license to speak to your people? So when I came in, they didn't know me other than I was a guy in a uniform, certain general. This guy was fantastic, African-American guy. He did his speech and he says, I want to introduce you to Brother Richard. And I come up on the pulpit there and I got more hallelujahs than I could have counted. Okay? But they left after that understanding what they needed to do to protect themselves because he gave me the privilege to come before his flock, okay? So I worked with and used the faith-based community to drive my message because I need a distribution network. So I respected it, I understand it, but I never took sides, okay? Comments, questions? Was there anybody else? Oh, I guess, am I standing between them and lunch? Is that it? I guess so, right? Okay, thank you all very much, appreciate it.